ago in Wyoming's Medicine Bow Mountains, a tough band of explorers and fur trappers battled for survival. Men like John C. Fremont, Jim Bridger, and Jeremiah Johnson scratched and clawed their way through the wilderness. Just down the road in Laramie, a descendant of this hardy breed played football at the University of Wyoming. Then, in 1972, Conrad Francis Dobler was drafted by the St. Louis Cardinals, and he scratched, clawed, bit, and leg whipped his way through the NFL. The game's violent. I'm not. I was just a, an arm to that, but it was nice to run into someone and hit him so hard. I used to call it a snot bubbler. That's when you hit him so hard, you just see that little bubble of snot come out of his nose there. And he knew he was laid into. And hey, I've had some snot bubbles laid on me too. <laughs> and I'd get up and say, boy, that was a good one. But I'll tell you what, I'm gonna find you before the game's over. <laughs> We're gonna trade this one off. We'll be back. But I enjoy pounding on them because I like to have them believe that, hey, here's a boy from Wyoming that just handed you your lunch. But before Conrad Dobler could hand anybody their lunch, he would have to sing for his in the training table tradition of a rookie singing for his supper. St. Louis Cardinal veterans were less than impressed with this cocky kid from Laramie. And it wasn't just his singing voice. Conrad Dobler made more mistakes during his rookie training camp than any player I've ever seen. And Dobler kept jumping off sides, and he kept blowing plays. And we kept hearing how smart he was that he had over a three-point average at Wyoming, and we didn't buy any of that. But the day that Conrad Dobler got cut, Tom Banks and I went out and had a beer, and we just laughed. I mean, we were delighted that this guy was finally out of our hair. And then he was back in a, in a couple of weeks, and of course, the rest is history. And I was determined, since they gave me the second opportunity to play for the St. Louis Cardinals, I wasn't going to let that happen again to me. That was one of the things that changed my philosophy on football, that they didn't really care whether I made it or not. That had to be from within. Hell, when I was at St. Louis Cardinals, I had to go home and take a nap. I had to get ready for the next day. <laughs> so I knew there was going to be some more people I was going to have to fight. Conrad Dober fought every day in practice for at least three years. I never saw anything like it. He fought every day, and he fought anybody that got in his way. And he did that until he developed into a good football player. And that's why the coaches kept me around, because I had the uh, chutzpah, the intestinal fortitude, the guts, the... Uh, I had it in the eyes to go out there and to play, to compete, to win. And they liked that about me. And the thing is, I felt that I had to keep that type of aggressiveness there. Because that's the thing that got me started. And when he first started in this league, he was uh, not a very talented football player. Chances are that he missed his block at the line of scrimmage. But what he did is he got up, he ran downfield, and knocked somebody down. He knocked down a linebacker, he knocked down a defensive back. He hustled and ended up making a play. Then what happened is that uh, over the years, he really developed into a good football player. He developed into one of the best pass protecting guards uh, that this game has seen. His techniques sometimes were bizarre. He would kick, he would leg whip, he would trip, but his man didn't get to the quarterback. And what happened is that this image of being the game's dirtiest player overshadowed all his accomplishments on the field as being a good football player. You know, a lot of people have talked about uh, the leg whips and things like this, but uh, I always thought we should have gotten points for that because I thought those were great athletic moves. But to be mobile and to be athletic like that, I think uh, I thought those, those were classical moves. But, you know, everyone would accuse me of this biting stuff, but uh, I've asked many, many people, if someone puts his fingers in your mouth in the field of combat, what, what are you going to do? One time we played the Cowboys in Dallas. Leroy Jordan put his hand up inside Conrad's face mask. Now, I don't know if it was to stroke his mustache or to conduct some sort of mayhem on Conrad's person. I don't know. All I know is that on their way up Conrad's face, his little fingers made a pit stop around Conrad's mouth. Leroy started yelling like there was no tomorrow. I don't know if I ever really broke rules. I think that I was a master at playing in the gray area of every rule ever made. I played in the gray areas and I was the best at it. Well, let's be honest about it. Conrad Dober was a self-styled and a factual dirty player. That was his way of compensating for 
a lack of some basic skills. And by getting people to forget that they were playing football and think they were in a street fight, he got the advantage because he was a good street fighter, not nearly as good a football player as he was a street fighter. That was my philosophy, is take the man out of his game, and then you own him. The more they concentrate on what I'm doing, the more they're concerned about me. They're not concentrating on the guy with the hoochie, the guy with the football. And as long as they're doing that, I don't even have to block the man. And I think Dober's the only guy that ever really got me to a point where I was angry enough to take a swing. Looking back, I got right on his level when I did that and, and quit playing the kind of football that I could have controlled him with and started trying to play the kind of football he wanted to play. Merlin lost his poise, and that's what bothers him more than anything else. Not any of the things that happen on the field, not the violence, not the combat, not the blocking, not the hit, not the punching. It was him losing his poise. And when the fourth quarter came along, he took himself off the field and I was still out there. You're right, you're damn right. He won't send me any flowers. <laughs> After he'd uh, been traded around a bit, he ended up in Buffalo. And I was down to do the game for NBC. And Dobler's mother and father were there. About that time, Conrad's father came over. You don't like my son, do you? Mr. Dobler, I said, I really have kind of put that behind me. I said, as a matter of fact, at practice today, I shook hands with Conrad. He said, you shook hands with my son? I said, yes. He said, count your fingers. In Buffalo, Dobler's reputation finally caught up with him. Officials took away the gray area in which he had flourished, and his career ended not as Conrad Dobler, three-time All-Pro, but simply the dirtiest player who ever lived. I think my only regret is that because of all this hype, because of all this good copy, people, um, people forget that, it, you know, maybe I did have a little bit of talent. Maybe I did do something a little bit different. I was a survivor. I had talent. And I think that's, they forget that I was a player of substance. I was the best at my position at one time. Protecting a slim three-point lead on the last play of the game.